Hi, I'm Jessica Morgan. I'm director at Dear Art Foundation. We are here today at George Condo's studio where we are discussing his project with Avant Art, which is a project to celebrate Dear's 50th anniversary. George is a trustee at Dear and a long-term supporter of our institution. George. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Um, George, you have a long history with Dia. You've been a trustee with us for many years now. But before that, you actually worked for Dia back yeah. in the 1980s. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit about this history with Dia. That's uh, quite funny. Um, I got to New York City in literally December of 79. And one of my first, the first, I think it was my first job was to shine the broken kilometer. So I remember walking into the building on West Broadway and seeing this incredible piece of art. And then when it wasn't open, you know, there were a bunch of us and we all had cans and cloths and our job was to shine the broken kilometer. And, um, which is, you know, Walter D. Maria's piece. And um, so I immediately, what I found the most, it was one of the most breathtaking experiences I ever had, you know, coming from a small town in Massachusetts and to see this thing. And also the thing that was the most fascinating to me was that as you shined the first pieces and you moved along, they raised slightly in height to give the effect that it was flat. And I thought it was a really, I just thought, the mathematical control in order to get this piece to read as one flat sheet of, you know, metallic rods was just amazing. So that was like my, my absolute first job that I had was that Dia. And yeah, you were immersed from the beginning. That was right there, in the, the, like the day I got in, you know, three days after arriving in New York. A friend of mine got me the job. He said, hey, I got this job. Dia's hiring people to shine the broken kilometer. And I went there. I knew who Walter Di Maria was. And I knew, and then of course, I went to see the Earth Room on Worcester Street and actually met Walter. And um, we talked about his days as a drummer for the Velvet Underground. And uh, that was quite cool. And I told him like, you know, when I was a kid, my first job was to shine the broken kilometer. And he was like, oh, God. <laughs> That's great. I mean, so you read, I feel like, George, you really understand the ethos of Dear. I mean, we're, we're so much focused on single artists, Walter De Maria, of course, being an incredibly important one. Um, but it sounds like you really understood that from, from the beginning, really, sort of what Dear was about. Well, I felt like Dear was all about the real desire of what the artist would like and the ultimate scenario of his of his way to portray his art that they provided the um space and the sort of quietude and the contemplation that any artist to that degree would want and that dia was there their mission it seemed to me was to provide the artist and equate the space with the desire of the artist for what he really wished he could have his art seem like. And I always admired that. I thought it was, which is why I joined the board, because I thought no other place that I can think of gives the artist really truly what they want in life in terms of like how their work is to be seen, whether it's the shadows or whether it's the Richard Serra's or the, or the Bruce Nauman's, you know, or whatever it was that I'd seen that you've done, and then extending up into Beacon, where it really took over, you know, and brought that into full fruition, so I felt. When you, I mean, you've been an incredible supporter of ours, as well as being a great trustee, George. I mean, you, you've helped um, acquire work by Joe Bear, one of the artists in the collection. You've helped with free admission by donating one of your paintings for sale to support funds so that we can be free to everybody in Chelsea. Um, I mean, maybe you can talk a bit about what, what that support has meant and, and being involved with Dia. Well, it meant to me that I was part of something that was, again, like honoring the desire and the true, um, you know, wish of the artist. And I thought like, this is a foundation that 
somehow I'd seen, you know, I'd met Heiner Friedrich in the beginning when he showed the skull paintings down, and I saw him, you know, I saw the exhibition of the large skull paintings that he'd done, and um, even had done an exhibition at Six Friedrichs Gallery in Munich, and when I was, I don't know, living in Cologne, but then coming back around to there, I mean, I think what it really meant for me was that there were a whole other generation of artists who were underrepresented, like Joe Bear, and um, great artists who had not really been recognized for the true talent that they had. And so when we went one day to look at a Joe Bear in that one strange gallery or apartment, I said, this is a great piece. We should get this for the museum. So I was happy to um, be a part of the financial you know, um, mechanism to get that work, let's call it, you know, donated some money to make that work part of the collection. And I thought, this is a good thing for her because um, here's an artist that not that many people know, but a great artist. And, um, and uh, I think that's one of the things about Dia that's really special is even with Mary Heilman. I'd known Mary since I showed together with her at Pat Hearn on 6th and D in the East Village. And she wasn't very well known at all, but I always thought she was a great painter. I always liked her her sort of dedication to the simplicity and sort of minimalistic aspect of painting, but at the same time using color and, and, and the shape of the canvases were really important, what I thought, how she fit things into the shape of the canvas. And um, so I just feel like, you know, that's part of the reason why my commitment to Dia is so strong is because what you do for the artist is so strong. Your commitment is so strong. Well, it's, it, I think it's particularly meaningful, and I, I think for them too, to know that another artist is supporting your work. It's like a very, very special thing. Obviously, the, the edition with Avon Art is an important print edition that's being produced, and um, you have a, a long history with printmaking, but um, part of that also relates to your second job in New York, which was working with Andy Warhol, uh, working on the silk screening. Warhol at that point was also very involved with Dia, in fact, so it's a, another point of connection. Uh, yes. He was working on the, the shadows for, for Dia's collection and had had a long, long relationship with Heine Friedrich as well. But I wonder if you can tell us a bit about that period of time and your, your time working in, in Andy's studio. Well, it was quite, it was pretty amazing because, you know, when I lived in Boston, I worked in a silkscreen shop making t-shirts. So I had a little bit of silkscreen sort of knowledge behind me. But what happened was, is right after the DIA job, I applied for a, um, through an employment agency, a job that got me a job in a small gallery, sort of near where Robert Maplethorpe was living across the street from the Strand, <laughs> believe it or not. and. Um, there was one little gallery there, and Rupert Smith, who was Andy's master printer, wanted to do a show with Warhol, and uh, he convinced Andy to do this show in Palm Beach. And so this little gallery that I was in for a week, it was a one-week job, he said, is there anybody here that can write a press release about you know, Andy Warhol's you know, collaborations on this show with Rupert Smith? So I said, I think I could do it. And so I wrote this thing, which had to be first read by Andy. So Warhol said, whoever wrote this, I'd like him to come to the factory and to write about everything that goes on, on a daily basis. And the guy said, would you take that job? I said, absolutely. And so for me, it was a little bit like having studied art history and thinking, you know, all the great painters were once an apprentice for another great painter. And I thought, okay, this is my chance, you know? If there's ever an artist I'd want to work for, it would be Andy Warhol. So I go down my first day there, which was on Duane Street. And so I got down to Duane Street, I had a little typewriter, and I started writing about it. And then they asked me if I knew anything about silkscreen. So I said, yeah, you know, I had done some silkscreen in the past. I do know how to do it. So they brought me a print of Diana Ross, and uh, there was a little 
like white spot in her hair. And they said, can you fix this? And so they gave me a cap, a little bottle cap with some black ink. And I bent down and I put it up there. And they all stood around and they said, wow. You're such a great artist. And they gave me a job as the diamond duster. So I began uh, diamond dusting with Warhol. And um, so I must have printed 5,000 prints, okay, in a short nine month period. And uh, the, um, the job was incredibly like labor intensive, okay, and he never came. I only met him twice, but he didn't know who I was. I just was there as a kid delivering like something that would be handed to Fred Hughes that would then be handed to Andy Warhol. And I just stood there and kept my mouth shut. And, um, but my responsibility was to like, the prints would already be printed. And the last point of the print was to put a film of glue and then put that down on a box and pick it up evenly so that there weren't any globs of, mm -hmm. you know, glitter or whatever. It was like purely diamond dusted, as some of the shadows are diamond dusted, and the shoes, and they, he'd been experimenting with this industrial diamond dust, which was used on sidewalks, apparently, to make them look sparkly. And Andy loved that, and he loved the glamour of the idea of his work being diamond dusted. But what he would do, which was really, I think, the most impressive, would be we'd be in the middle of a print, and the phone would ring, and it was kind of a red phone, like the kind you'd see at like the White House. And when the red phone rang, it meant it was Andy Warhol. And he would say, I don't like the green. I want it changed to Liz Taylor Green. And so they'd send me to this little closet that had millions of cans of green. It would say Liz Taylor Green, 1963 or four. And so I grabbed the green, they would remix that green and then we'd do that green. And then they would show him that print and he'd say, okay, I like that green. And so he was radio controlling the operation at all times. It was like amazing how much control without being there he had over how the prints came out, which is how you can tell a fake Warhol from a real one. Hmm. Because it's not, it's pretty evident when you have a real Warhol, what it is. And it's pretty evident when there's a fake one, what it is as well. And it has to do with the fact that without even being there, he could control the, the, the art. So basically, he wanted it. The, the prints were just being ferried to him immediately. Yeah, after. always yeah, right away. He wouldn't come because the reason he didn't come was because of the fumes, the smell of the gasoline that we, we had to clean the screens with gasoline. And we had to um, lay them to rest. And without any time to think, we had to get the next screen on. So, you know, the whole place just was just smelled like incredible fumes. And, and Andy was so concerned with his health mm -hmm. at that time. And, and when I met him a couple of years later, he had bought some paintings of mine and said that he'd like to meet me. And I remember I was at Keith Haring's studio and I said, I don't want to tell Andy that I worked for him. And um, he came and he was quite funny about it all, but he was, but when I got to go out to dinner with him and hang out with him, I realized how health conscious he was. And they would never go to a place where there was that much, you know, that many fumes. But the wildest thing was that there were so many throwaways, okay? There were so many that kind of came out where the registration was off that me and this kid, Michael, we would just crunch them up and throw them in a bag and bring them down to a dumpster. And the dumpsters were on Duane Street and they were like a dumpster you'd see in New York with billions of dollars of Andy Warhols in them. And nobody would even think about it. They, were, they weren't even really that bad. You know, they were just like one little registration off, which is kind of what makes his work cool when they're sort of off register or he didn't like the color. And so in the dumpster, we just yeah. throw out thousands of them per day. Tell us a bit, George, about living in New York at that time. And I mean, obviously you're working for this incredibly famous artist. I mean, mm. how, how was your life at that time? Well, I, I felt sort of like 
I was, um, I don't know what I want to, you know, preordained to get there somehow as an artist in my own right. I felt like, you know, I've made it this far to the point where none of my friends could even believe that I was doing this job. You know, they all had lousy jobs. And um, then I got this job working for Warhol was a huge thing. And I felt like, all right. And then they gave me some, they there at the, fa at the factory, they gave me some paper. Like there were a lot of different kinds of paper. And there were some pink sheets and some various different papers. So I got free paper from there. And I would just work very hard at my own art in the East Village when I lived there. And I'd already met John michel Basquiat, and I'd already not had, I hadn't met Keith Haring yet, but I met John michel And um, he was the one that told me, don't go, you know, you should move from Boston to New York because you'll never sell a painting in Boston. People in Boston, he said, don't buy art. He said, you should move here. So I did. And, um, and then when I got the job working for Warhol, he loved Andy Warhol, you know, and obviously, one of John's idols was uh, Andy, and they did their collaboration together in the future some years later. But still, it was just the time hanging around with John Michel and the time living in the East Village. It was a lot more dangerous. It was a lot freakier. It was a lot sort of, in a weird way, um, kind of riskier to be walking around at 2.30 or 3 in the morning coming out of a club and uh, going home. And I was always staying at somebody else's place. I never really had my own place. So finally, and um, once I finally started selling some paintings, when Andy bought some paintings and Keith bought some paintings, when I met them, by then I was very good friends with all the graffiti painters, Ramel Z, Toxic, A1, Futura. And um, I knew the whole, group of them all. And they used to come to my apartment in the East Village and just buzz and keep their finger on the buzzer at three in the morning until I opened the door. And I said, I'd better move uptown. So that's when I moved up to the Ritz Carlton in um, 57th Street in Central Park West. And so that's when I'd go to the Odeon for dinner with Andy and we'd drive home and I'd get to talk to Andy about uh, art you know, what exhibitions he'd seen, what things he liked, and realized he was so non-superficial. He was not at all what his persona portrayed him to be. He was incredibly, and he knew everything about art. So you could talk to, you know, Andy Warhol if you wanted to about Grunewald, or you could talk to him about, you know, Rembrandt's late portraits or whatever, or have you seen that great one at the National Gallery in London and all these kind of things. and. And then he later wrote in his diaries about me living at the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> Did you talk about the printmaking? I mean, it was obviously really hard work. What's that? Studio. Did you ever talk to him about your, your time working in the studio? Never told him. No. I never had the chance to tell him. He asked me if I wanted to trade a um, portrait of, you know, that he would do my portrait to trade for one of my paintings. And I said, I'd love to have a, um, I'd love to have a paint by number portrait. And he said, oh, I haven't done one of those in a long time. I said, wouldn't that be cool, Andy? Like a paint by number one where you only have to paint in little bits and pieces and just have the numbers sort of like the daffodils or the, the ones that, you know, whatever the one, the Ludwig. And um, the, it was just an idea. And then he went in the hospital and then he never came out. So we never got to do it. Back to silk screening. Um, you sort of developed a technique of, of kind of painterly, let's say, silk screening yeah. um, over time. Um, and, you know, it, it's maybe you can talk a bit about how that impacted your practice. I mean, how, how your, your kind of facility and technical um, expertise around um, printmaking evolved over time as well. Well, in the last four or five years, what I started to think about was like taking, well, first of all, what I did in 19, I would say 1999, I decided to silk screen some abstract paintings because I thought I'd never seen that before. And I remember um, I did 
my own version of jazz record album covers. And usually jazz record album covers in the 50s and in the 40s had really kind of cool abstract paintings on them. And above it, like the Blue Note series would have a sort of line and just, you know, the name of the artist and the name of the album. And so underneath it would be a sort of random abstract painting by somebody. And actually Andy had done a number of them. He did Kenny Burrell. He did, he did a whole series of jazz album covers. Um, so I always wanted to do my own jazz album covers for my hero, like Billie Holiday or, or, or John Coltrane. So I silk screened abstract. I realized with this one with Heinrichi, who had done, Alexander Heinrichi, who had done previous to Rupert. I think he did the skulls. And, um, and he worked for a long time with Andy. And um, so we silk screened abstract paintings on canvas, and I regained my interest in silkscreen again. And I started to make collage pieces out of old master paintings mixed with television uh, characters. So I would take somebody like Granny from the, from the uh, Beverly Hillbillies and put her over a virgin uh, Mary. And um, so we made these silkscreens, and I got back into silkscreening. And I remember Christopher Wool came to my show where I did the jazz, and he had been doing black and white sort of, you know, eagles and and things like that, but he hadn't tried, you know, silk screening abstraction, and it looks really cool, you know. So, so I got back into it, and then, then I sort of departed from it until I did one small print for Bard College where my daughter went, and the next most exciting silk screens I've made are with Avant Art, okay? And I mean, they've really managed to get the blends of the colors, like the, what, well, I started to do this thing with the paintings where I'd take a piece of paper and I would smash it up against the canvas and move the paint from here to there to there. So it started to look like if you had a whole section in like a deep blue and you grab some red and put it over it, mm -hmm. I, it felt like I was working sort of as a silk screen artist, but with paint. Because I remember Andy used to paint with mops on his canvases, and then he would go over them, the ladies and gentlemen and all those. And, um, and so I, I started to kind of like fake silk screen paintings. But then I always thought that this would be too technically complicated for a um, silk screen maker to get that effect without the artist actually painting the ground first and then putting the black um, mm -hmm. screen over it, which is what we did. Um, but I, I, I'm pretty surprised at the quality of what we've got here with Avant Art for, um, and it's really amazing because you know, the number of colors and number of really complex blends that they managed to get of the tonalities and things and, and very accurate. Tell us a bit about um, working with Avant Art sort of how that process has evolved. Uh, well, it evolved with the idea of like, let's find some images that could be silkscreened, first of all, that could in fact work. And I think they were extremely astute in choosing the images that were not only sort of poppy and vibrant, but also you could get the textural sort of quality of painting out of multiple you know, screens. I don't know how many screens they use because I remember with screens, you know, you could put, say you were on a yellow screen, you'd have this part yellow over here and this part yellow over there and you put the yellow screen down, take that one out and then it'd be the next screen and you just have some red lips and if there was any other red, you know, it'd be in another area so they would never touch one another. But um, so it seems to be a rather complex yeah, I think it's 20, 20 layers. Yeah, yeah. there are yeah. more. I think it's like 28 or some number. George, any advice for young printers these days? People who are... Um, who are... I think it's a worthy um, medium to be working in. I don't think silk screening... I've never been an offset lithograph person or a, or a um, you know, the stone where you print on, you know, like that kind of thing. I've always loved silk screening. I'd say um, artists 
should, you know, even if they never use or try to silk screen anything, they might try to mimic it in their work. They might try to get the effect of silk screen in their painting. You know, I don't know how they're going to do it, but I mean, it's like a thing that looks really good. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, a lot of what aesthetics about is, you know, not just the quality and the conceptual meaning, but just the look. And the look is really great. Can you just introduce the, the three works that have been selected for these editions? Well, I know we have Lost in Time, which is kind of a hippie-like character from the 70s who appears to still be living in this sort of time zone that he was, you know, sort of kind of like a loser on, you know, I imagined him as some kind of a lost relic of the 70s or 60s wandering the sidewalks of Venice Beach in California and stopped to have a smoke and turn his head with his sort of multicolored paisley-like shirt or something. And then we've got the large blue head, um, which is a sort of a kaleidoscopic kind of view of a single figure that involves a lot of emotional states taking place at the same time, which is something that I think um, was important to me was to say, I don't want to paint the way people look on the outside. I don't want to be a representational painter. I want to paint what I think is on the interior, what's actually going through their mind as opposed to what they look like. And um, so both the blue one and the yellow one have a lot to do with the internal dialogue within a person's um, sort of everyday state of mind. That they may be just thinking of random thoughts, they may be experiencing joy, horror, happiness, uh, sadness, all of these things at once. And it's all happening, um, it's not really, visible. I mean, somebody breaking down and crying, it's one thing you think, oh, they're sad. But what do you do when you just see somebody and you can't, you know, really read their mind? So it's kind of like reading somebody's mind in a strange way. And I, I called it psychological cubism because I couldn't think of a better way to describe it that you'd see sort of four sides of a person's personality as opposed to just four sides of their face at once. And so it was about the idea of capturing, um, you know, the numerous different emotions that go through a person's head at a single time. What would you say, I mean, you, you sort of, you, you take from so many different sources, George, and you sort of such a sponge and then you, you know, things come out through your own very specific language, but would you say that there were um, particular influences or interests um, when you were working at this time, the sort of 20, 2018, 2019, when you were working on these, these paintings? I mean, I, I, I feel like I've been doing this since I was a kid, and it's sort of like a natural occurrence for me to go to a white canvas and say that I can't stand looking at a white canvas, and I've got to do something with it, and it doesn't matter what it is. And then ultimately I construct something and it tends to most likely be a kind of portrait. And, um, and it, in, in doing so, like they bring family memories, you know, memories when I was a kid, like, you know, and sitting around with my aunts and uncles and cousins and, or just things that you see like, a kid going off in a school bus with a bunch of other kids or a crazy bus driver or the garbage man or, um, you know, just everyday ordinary people rather than the kind of glamorous uh, characters that you see on the covers of, you know, magazines like Sports Illustrated or I don't know what they are anymore. I don't, you know, what are the GQ or this, that, the other thing and think they always got the best looking people and it's just for all the rest of the world they can't you know they don't they never get sort of glamorized and so i thought as a painter i'd like to glamorize the sort of normal everyday human 
to a certain degree to sort of elevate them to the level of being worthy of being in a painting. And so I think the idea of um, just capturing that sort of spirit of humanity and not the idea of uh, sort of dehumanizing, but sort of rehumanizing uh, people, which I think we live in a world of dehumanization to a lot of degree. And um, I think it's wrong. And I think that, um, you know, to take just your everyday average person and give them a chance to be an artwork is a good thing. You've used this expression, George, um, artificial realism in the past. Mm. Um, can you talk a bit about what, what that means to you? Well, yeah, actually. Um, so Robert Rosenblum once asked me back in the late 80s, he said, I mean, what do you call this stuff that you do? He said, I mean, I wouldn't call it neo-surrealism. And I said, it's not neo-surrealism. And so I said, uh, I'll give it a think. And so I started thinking about um, some of the philosophical um, uh, books that I'd read by Hegel, by Heidegger, and by people like that. And it was about the idea of presencing, and as opposed to um, uh, referencing, okay? The presence of something comes mm -hmm. through your art. And, uh, and I, I, I thought to myself, I'm gonna call it artificial realism, because realism, which is reality, is the, um, defined as that which exists external to our perception, um, but it's really there. And artificial is defined as man-made. And so I thought it's the man-made um, realism of what's really there. And what's really there is basically man-made. And so there were a lot of different aspects to it that I thought had to do with the simultaneous presencing of various different man-made um, uh, sort of, it's, it's, it's tricky, it's sort of man-made functional objects in life, okay, where things took the place of, like a plastic cup took the place of a glass, uh, okay? Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, artificial could also refer to the behavior of um, a person as much as it, it wouldn't refer to the physical uh, sort of makeup of a person, but it could refer to their behavior. And so there were two departments of artificiality. One was the sort of, you know, the behavioral aspect of a human, and the second was the what that person is capable of making on their own, which would then be artificial. Um, given the fact that it was man-made. It wasn't created, it's not a rock. It wasn't created by nature, it was created by a person. And so, at the time, I worked out these kind of equations in my mind and on paper and, and thought about a way to describe my work as artificial realism. And I thought, well, so much of art is about artificial realism, even Stuart Davis. Well, I was thinking mm -hmm. the signs and the logos and the, you know, the jazz clubs and the this, that. A lot of those things and then, you know, moving into what Andy Warhol was doing with pop art could be seen as artificial realism. And I thought Jeff Koons could be seen as artificial realism. And so much could come under that context. But little did I ever think that when we got into the Trump era that he would start calling it the fake news and that he, disinformation, so artificial realism, which was originally an expression that was relegated towards an artistic concept, has become what we now have in the world of disinformation that we live in. So we live in a world of artificial realism, and not only that, we live in a world of AI and artificial intelligence. And so, it was never meant to be something like that, but it's a little bit like, I don't think relativity, when Einstein created it, was ever meant to be an atomic bomb. 
but artificial realism turned out to be what we have now in our world of you know the news and in our world of politics you foresaw the horror yeah it's, it's awful yeah. um george maybe you can get back to this idea of sort of um how you begin these works so these these three portraits in a way i mean when you when you come to them are you thinking about these specific references or are they is it more improvisational as you're beginning to work particularly with these three i think it i think it's a um it's a it comes from my musical background where you know which was basically a music theory background where you analyze chords and you analyze progressions of whether it might be like um, Brahms or something like Schubert or whatever, and you start to think in terms of like how um, key changes, you know, key signatures and chord changes move along and move into separate keys. And so I think like as a painter, I start, I think very musically. I want them to sound like something. I don't want them to just look like something. I want them to sound like things. And I want the um, transitions of forms to move the same way that the transitions of key changes and musical, um, yeah, let's just call it uh, chordal progressions and those kind of things work. So I, I think that, um, that, you know, they are improvisational, but they're also, uh, have a lot to do with themes and variations, you know, which is something like another thing that is um, a musical term. But in fact, you know, I learned a lot from that in the idea of like, if you think about the Goldberg variations or the Diabelli variations of Beethoven, they're motifs. Okay, so you've got a motif and then you just, that is your theme. And then your variations are the numerous different variations on a single motif. And so that's how they just continuously expand into various different characters. So you might have a simple motif like a triangle and a, and a, and a sort of what's under a triangle. And then the shading will take place. And then suddenly, you know, it's just a motific developments in painting is really what it comes down to. And I think that that is um, some of the beauty of what you learn in music and what you can do with painting is that you can take what seem to be extremely joyous colors or extremely, you know, uh, happy colors and you can put them together with things that are um, somehow there's some degree of, like I say, psychological state where somebody may be in a great mood in the morning and that same person gets horrible news in the afternoon and this is that dissonant moment in their life where happiness turns to, you know, not horror but just sadness. And the end of their day, it's a lot of people consoling them and a whole kind of feeling of um, trying to find a way to, you know, sort of understand the way the world works. And in and, and art, sometimes you only need four colors to get that much energy out of a painting. You can just keep mixing those four colors together. And I think that was what was great about Picasso was in his Cubist period, he's very little color, but he could make hundreds of colors out of just four colors. And Rembrandt could do the same with his late paintings, that if you look at them in black and white, you ever happen to take a look at one of, one of the late self-portraits in black and white, they're so physiognomically like, exact, you would think it's a black and white photo that he was copying. Hmm. And um, it's just a question of understanding color balance and um, physical space. I think um, artists like to try to find a way to describe the way that the world works. And um, just back to Dia, I mean, you guys have figured out a way to make the world understand how art works by giving it the space that it needs for it to function, 
properly so that you get the experience of what the artist is really, really, really trying to say in his work.